The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. It's coming. All these voices. My name is James Hershey. Right back. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Staring into the Abyss. I am your host, horror author James Hershey Jr. And with me as always, my co-host, old boy James Ash. How you doing, brother? I am doing good. How's everybody doing tonight? On tonight's episode, we are going to be talking about a very interesting creature. And that is the Mongolian Death Worm. The Mongolian Death Worm probably has the least amount of actual evidence of any of the creatures that we've done on the show. And you might be saying to yourself, well, if it has the least amount of evidence, how do you know it's real? Well, that's what we're going to find out tonight, if it's real or not. Uh, when I say the least amount of evidence, I really mean that, because there are zero pictures of this thing. There is absolutely no video footage. Nessie, we have pictures. With Bigfoot, we have pictures. And we have footprints and, and all that kind of stuff. There's nothing on this thing. There's no prints. There's no good physical evidence of any kind. There's never been a body found, nothing. So you might think, okay, well, if there's absolutely zero physical evidence that this thing exists, then it's just a tall tale. It's just a legend. It doesn't exist. The problem with that is that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of eyewitness reports. And in the local folklore, this thing is not considered a legendary creature. It's considered a real creature. People in in that area of the Gobi Desert, they really watch out for this thing, and they're worried about it. They believe it to be a real creature. So whenever you see that where there's thousands of eyewitness reports and the local people in the area where the creature is supposed to reside truly believe it's there, so much so that they, they keep an eye out for it and they adjust their, their life accordingly to make sure that they don't run into this thing. When you see that, that gives you an inkling that this thing could very well be a real creature. Now, the best idea physically of what this thing looks like, I'll give a basic rundown of it. It's about two to seven feet long, somewhere in that range. It's a very, very thick, very, very big. It's usually red. And what it does is it tunnels under the ground. And it'll actually leave a little ripple of sand on top as it goes. And supposedly that's how you can tell where they are and, and that they're moving along. I wish that, that that would be captured on film because that would be a really cool thing to see. In 1922, the Mongolian prime minister actually described the worm. And it's captured in, uh, on the trail of ancient man. And this is what he said, quote, It is shaped like a sausage about two feet long, has no head nor legs, and it is so poisonous that merely to touch it, means instant death. It lives in the most desolate parts of the Gobi Desert. 
Now that brings us into our next little area here, which is the abilities, the powers, uh, what this creature does. Now the Mongolians believe that even just the slightest touch of this creature's body means instant death and severe, severe pain as you die. So the surface of its skin must be covered in some sort of poison of some sort, a fast-acting poison that kills you pretty quick. They also say that it can kill at a distance. Now it does this in a couple different ways. Uh, the first way is by spraying a venom at its prey. Now when I say spraying a venom at its prey, it's not exactly like something like a spitting cobra would do. See, a spitting cobra will shoot venom at its prey as well. And that venom is aimed towards the eyes, and the intent is to blind and disable the prey. The Mongolian death worm doesn't do it in exactly that way. What it does is it will stand up almost to its full length above the ground. At least half of it is above the ground. Sometimes almost the full length of it comes out above the ground. And it will begin to swell up near the top of it. It'll reach a point where it has swelled very, very large and it will explode. Now obviously the worm doesn't explode itself. So it must have some sort of opening like a, like a mouth of some sort or some sort of opening there that is closed off until it reaches a certain level and then it shoots that poison out. Now they say that that, that venom uh, makes everything covered in like a yellow and it is very, very, very corrosive. It will melt your skin right off. Supposedly, according to the legends, it can even melt through metal almost instantly, which as far as I know is pretty much physically impossible to do. I mean, there are things that can go through metal. Different acids can, can eat through metal, and something like a thermite can burn through metal and melt it, but to do it instantly is pretty much physically impossible. But I think when they say instantly, they don't mean like instantly. I think they mean very quickly, probably. So if that is true, then that means that this poison, this venom, is extremely, extremely corrosive. The second way that the Mongolian death worm can kill you at a distance is through electricity, which is very interesting. Supposedly, it can shoot out electricity, almost like a lightning bolt, over a distance and it can strike you and electrocute you. Now there are examples of this in nature of different creatures that can electrocute you like the electric eel, which isn't actually an eel, it's actually a fish, but the name of it is the electric eel. But see, the electric eel, you have to pretty much touch it or get right next to it to get shocked. This thing supposedly can kill you at a distance with electricity. Now there are things that can shoot electricity a, a decent little distance, but the only thing I know of that can really shoot electricity at a long distance is lightning. But supposedly this thing can hit you from, from several feet away with a electrical charge. So that's very interesting. I'd, be, I'd like to know how it accomplishes that, how the electricity doesn't dissipate into the air and just end up being almost nothing by the time it gets to you. But according to the legend, it's enough to kill you, so it has to be still pretty strong. Now the worm supposedly lives under the ground, so you only see it when it comes up to attack or you only see the ripples on the ground as it's moving around. And that's probably why, if this thing exists, there aren't any pictures or film of it. Because if it only comes up when it's about to attack, then probably the people that it attacks don't live to show a picture of it. Or even to take a picture of it, probably. But they say that this thing hibernates the majority of the year. The only time it is not hibernating is in June and July, and that's when the Mongolian death worm supposedly becomes active. It's also reported that the most common time for this thing to actually come to the surface is after it rains and the ground is still wet. Now, according to legends, and this part is kind of, kind of creepy, but it's also kind of cool. It says in the legends that the Mongolian death worm preyed mostly on camels and uh, human beings as well, but mostly camels. And what it would do is it would come up and it would attack them and kill them. And it would lay its eggs in the intestines of the camel. And then the eggs would feed on the intestines and the other organs of the camel. 
after they hatched, made new worms, they would feed on that, and then they would go down underground. Now, there have been several different expeditions to actually try to find the Mongolian death worm and prove that it actually exists. Um, in 1990 and in 1992, a guy named Ivan Mackerel led a small group into the Gobi Desert to try to find the worm. He constructed a motor-driven uh, thumper machine, and he even used very small explosive charges to try to locate it and drive it to the surface. In both expeditions, he came up completely empty and had zero evidence that the creature actually existed. In 2005, a zoological journalist named Richard Freeman uh, mounted an expedition to try to find the worm as well. But just like Mackerel, he also came up empty-handed. And his conclusion was that the tales of the worm's powers had to be just folklore. And that the sightings that the people were having were most likely an unknown species of worm lizard or some other local creature that is either yet undiscovered or misidentified. The TV show Destination Truth they conducted an expedition um, in 2006 and 2007, and they also came up with no real evidence. A guy named David Ferrier, who was a reporter for TV3 News in New Zealand, they did an expedition in August of 2009, and they didn't find anything. But he, the interesting thing about this one is he conducted, but the interesting thing about this one is that he conducted interviews with the locals that had claimed to have actually seen the Mongolian death worm. And his conclusion was that the sightings of this thing peaked sometime in the 1950s. That's when the majority of the sightings were happening. The National Geographic Channel, um, for their show Beast Hunter, they had an episode on whether or not the creature existed as well. So there's been a lot of attempts to find this thing and prove that it exists or prove that it doesn't by some pretty big budget and reputable people. Now it's called the Mongolian death worm. Now some people say that it's impossible for a worm to get this large, to get seven feet. But worms are, are very interesting creatures and their physiology is a lot different than the majority of the rest of the creatures on earth. For example, they lack the ability to see, they cannot hear, they rely on a very highly developed sense of touch, and they have amazing senses of taste and smell in which they, they use chemicals to, to determine what they're seeing, what they're tasting, what they're smelling. They also have no lungs, and you might think, well, how do they breathe? They, they should be alive if they don't have any lungs, that's, that's weird. And it is kind of weird, but they, they breathe through their skin. And they actually use their circulatory system to carry the oxygen and the carbon dioxide all around their body. Now, this allows them to grow very large in some countries. So it is possible for a worm to get this size in an extreme case of, of seven foot, but it's definitely possible for one to be two or three feet long. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule, that, rule that out. The thing that makes it so that it can't be a worm, like I said before, is the fact that it lives in a desert. See, worms usually live in soil, and they have to have a certain level of moisture in order to survive. And the soil is usually fairly cool. You don't want it to be too hot, because if it's too hot, the worm will dry out, and it'll die. Now, there are worms that have adapted to live in sand rather than soil. Uh, the giant beach worm. It, which is found in the beaches in Australia. That's one example of, of a worm that has adapted to live in sand, and it can grow very large too, up to two and a half meters. So you might think, okay, this thing can't be an actual worm. And I would agree with you, I don't think it can actually be a worm if it exists. So what is it? I mean, that's the million dollar question. If it's not a worm, then what the hell is it? Some people say that it might be a creature called a skink, but Skinks have very little legs and scaly skins, and the witness accounts of the Mongolian death worm say that it has no limbs and its body is very smooth. So that rules the skink out. Most likely what this thing is, is either 
a worm lizard, like a, a new type of worm lizard that we haven't discovered yet. And a worm lizard, for people that don't know, is actually a lizard. It's a reptile, but it burrows up underneath the ground and it looks like a worm. It's very fascinating. You'll have to look that up sometime. Another thing that this thing could possibly be is a sand boa. In the desert, there are a lot of different snakes. You have sidewinders. You have all kinds of different things. I'm not sure exactly what kind of snakes live in the Gobi. I haven't studied that. But you do have creatures called sand boas, and that is a type of snake that is found in deserts sometimes. So it could possibly be a sand boa. That would make sense in a way because if you have a creature that is shooting out venom, we do know that there are snakes and there are reptiles that can do that, both. So either one of those will fit that aspect of it. It looks like a worm or a snake. And it'll come up out of the sand, at least half of its body, to attack. That would fit a snake as well. So that's another possibility is it could possibly be a sand boa. In 2005, there was an expedition that I talked about earlier from the Center for Fortean Zoology. And they crossed a thousand miles of the Gobi trying to find this death worm. And they concluded that most likely... The Mongolian death worm was a large unknown type of worm lizard and that the powers that people say it has were just folklore. So they believe that this thing was a worm lizard as well. Now the thing that makes this a monster type creature instead of just some unknown animal that we're trying to figure out if it actually exists is the fact that according to the locals in the area, the Mongolian death worm has killed several people, many people, so much so that during the months of June and July, they are very, very careful about going out in the desert where this thing could be. They try to avoid it if they can, because much like in a movie Tremors, it is believed that this thing will will track you down and kill you. Now, in the movie Tremors, it was sound that drew the creature towards you. If this thing was a worm, we know worms can't hear. But they can pick up on vibrations in the soil. And that might be how this thing is tracking people as they walk across the desert, is they can feel the vibrations in the soil. Because like I said, they have a very, very good sense of taste and smell, and they can pick up those vibrations if it's a worm. If it's a worm lizard or a snake, like we were talking about, like I think it is, snakes have a organ that I talked about on another show. They have an organ called the Jacobson organ, and they flick their tongue out and they actually grab air molecules and bring back to the Jacobson organ, and that's how they kind of map out their surroundings because their eyesight isn't very good. Maybe it's using some sort of system like that. Maybe it has little tiny hairs on the outside of its body that can pick up vibration. I don't know. It's possible spiders have that. So there is examples of that in nature as well. But they believe that this thing actually exists, and, and according to the reports, it has actually attacked human beings. So it's something that, that you want to you wanna prove one way or the other, if you can, whether it exists. Unfortunately, I don't think unless there's a body found that we're ever going to know. And I think even if one of these things die, most likely since it lives underground almost all of the time and only comes up to feed then most likely you are not going to ever find a body. Because if they die, they'll most likely die under the ground, unless somebody gets lucky and kills one when they're being attacked. But most likely the bodies are going to be under the ground when they die. So the odds of finding one aren't very good. It also depends on what this thing is. Because if it's a worm, worms don't have a skeleton. If you dissect a worm and cut it open, all you find inside of it is dirt and a little bit of organs, but mostly dirt. It doesn't have a, a vertebrae like, like normal creatures do. And worms also don't eat people, and they don't eat meat. They don't eat any of that stuff, really. Most worms, like that earthworm, it actually feeds on the soil. It, the soil comes in one end and goes all the way through the worm and out the back end like a conveyor belt. It just goes right through. And the worm just sucks the nutrients out of the soil, and that's how it feeds. Now you have 
like red wiggler worms and stuff like that that are composting worms that will eat paper and cardboard and fruit scraps and vegetable scraps and stuff like that. But the majority of of worms don't. They they feed mostly on soil and some vegetation. So if it's a worm, it's not going to be feeding on people most likely, unless it's a brand new thing that we never discovered before and it's completely different than every other species of worm. If it's a snake or a lizard, then very well it could feed on people or camels or meat. That makes a lot of sense. And that's what makes me also think that we're not dealing with a worm here. We're dealing with either a lizard or a snake because it eats meat. I and mean, there are a lot of reports of this thing killing and eating people. And large livestock animals such as cattle, sheep, goats, that kind of thing. So do I believe that the Mongolian deathworm actually exists? I think it's very possible. Even though there's absolutely no evidence as far as physical evidence or photographs or anything like that of this thing being real and, and actually existing, I still think that it's possible this thing exists. There's so many reports of it and there's such rich folklore and history on it that I think it's very possible. There's nothing about this creature that is out of the realm of possibility. People say the size of it makes it impossible, but that's not true. Because if it's a worm, there are examples of large worms. If it's a lizard, there are examples of very large lizards. If it is a snake, we all know there's definitely examples of snakes getting well past seven feet. I mean, you have anacondas that can be 20 or 30 feet. Some of the big boa constrictors get almost that size. And if this thing is a sand boa, then seven feet is nothing. I mean, that's easy. So I don't think the size disqualifies it from being a real animal. And I think that's what this thing is, is an animal. I don't think this is in any way supernatural at all. I think this is probably an unknown species that we have not truly discovered yet of either snake or, or lizard that lives underground, burrows underground. And I don't think it necessarily hibernates all year long like the legends say it does and only comes out two months. It might only be active for two months a year. That's when it feeds. But it might have a very slow digestive system. And so it comes up for those two months and feeds as much as possible and goes back down. And it might take a long time for that food to digest. Snakes digest food over time. And they can go many, many months without eating after they've had a big meal. So this very well could be the exact same thing. So my ruling on it, my opinion, is that I believe that the Mongolian death worm could very well exist. I think it's highly possible. Now I'm going to throw it over to Old Boy now. I'm going to get his opinion on it and see what he thinks of the Mongolian death worm. Yeah, thank you, James. And this is a very interesting story, guys. I, I actually forgot about this. I wanted to do this like a year ago about the Mongolian death worm. And this has always been a great story because I've always been intrigued by this creature because it shoots lightning and, and a yellow acid at people. I love this story because it's one of my favorite creatures. That, Bigfoot, and a couple other ones. But I've always heard about this story. But I forgot about it to recently. And I just brought it up to James, so we did it. And I'm kind of happy about this. I have an opinion what this might be. A couple things, actually. And I'll get to that in a minute. It, you know, like he was saying, it goes two to seven feet, even bigger. There's actually rumors of it getting to ten feet. But the more majority of average is seven feet to, to five feet. They, they, don't, they really don't say how much this thing weighs. That's one thing. It's wide. It's about two to two and a half feet wide, what I've read. And it's, it's like a snake. But the thing about this, and this is where I'm going to come on. Actually, there is pictures of it. I, I, there's a skeleton of it. It, they say it is, and it, it's really looking, it, it doesn't look like a worm, and that's the weird thing, it has a skeleton to it, and it was like five feet long, I saw it, I don't know if it was real, like I said, I have seen a picture of it, it's a skeleton, of supposedly a dead, a dead version of it, what I think this might be, is when he was saying a snake, uh, a sand boa, the only problem with sand boas don't spit acid, and shoots electricity. A lot of things don't shoot electricity, majority. So that's that's a weird thing, too. I think that might be something exaggerated. 
but thousands of people say this thing does this or kills people and eats them. So that's what's weird about this. How is a seven foot worm going to eat a six foot person? Well, think about it. This acid, he's whatever this yellow acid it sprays, and it's supposed to almost absorb through metal or eat through metal. What I was thinking is maybe it, it rips, it tears to the bone, it kills you, it blinds you, whatever, and it eats through your body. And it absorbs all this, you know, like 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 the flesh and stuff like that. And it melts your bones. Because if it can melt metal, it can melt bone. So what I'm thinking this might be, and it, they also think it might be a lizard. I don't know. It looks like a worm. It has little eyes, and it's, but it's, it's not a worm. It has a skeleton body to what I've seen of it. So what I think this might be some kind of new creature altogether. Something new. Or... It's a new kind of snake hybrid with a worm or something like a lizard or, or a lizard snake or something. I don't know because it's poisonous. See, that's really weird because the thing shoots a yellow poison. Snakes shoot out venom. Some, there, there is that one reptile that shoots blood. But this acid, it sounds like almost like, like you remember Jurassic Park, that one lizard that ran up and shot like that acidy stuff to that, that heavy set guy. He was trying to take, uh, you know, the they stole the embryos from the Jurassic Park, and he tried to sne sneak away, and he fell in the mud, and that one creature came, and it looked like a regular... He should have shot that green acidy stuff. That's what it sounds like, but it's not, a, it's not a reptile. But I don't know. It could be. It's not impossible. I don't know what it is. It's as long as an intestine, but it's fatter, and it's got spikes on the end of its face, and it has little eyes... Or it doesn't have any eyes, and it has just a big opening. Like, remember Tremors, like he was talking about, and they even have movies about this, like B-League movies, The Night of the Mongolian, uh, The Killing Mongolian Death Worm. There's a bunch of <laughs> B-League sci-fi movies, and, and then Tremors. But they're a lot bigger. They're like 15 feet long, and they're huge, and they eat you. And there's some that say it even eats goats and sheep in the, in the Kobe Desert. And camels, like he was saying, and then it lays eggs in its intestines or the humans, and they get bigger. Now, the size of it, I wouldn't doubt it because there's other species that get that big. Especially if it's a snake, we know they get huge. If it's a snake, it's believable. Even a worm gets two to three feet long. There's some in Australia and other places. I think there's a giant worm in, in some parts of Africa It's like two feet long. The only thing is these things don't shoot acid or electricity. I don't know where the electricity thing comes from. Maybe, like he was saying, it's some kind of weird ill, like a hybrid ill, maybe. It just, it got, what I'm saying is it got lost in time. Remember, this used to be ocean everywhere. So maybe something, it came and got, it hybrided here to survive, like it, it, it not mutated, but it evolved to survive the, the atmosphere of the sand. And there's no moisture, really, in the sand unless it rains once in a while. Like you said, it only comes out in July and June. June, that's weird. Because why would it only come out two times a year? And, yeah, it can feast like snakes. They only eat twice or three times a month. I mean, a couple months, I mean, sorry. And they go back. But this is weird because it, it, it leaves a little weird tracks before it comes to you. So I think it can hear not hear you, but it can feel the vibrations of the ground. Sound. And that would explain electricity. Why it shoots off this electricity, maybe it's like a static that's on it, and that's how it feels through the electricity. And when it comes out, it doesn't zap you, it's just you get, you get hit by it because it, it because maybe this, how fast, because it, it goes, they say it goes really quick. So maybe it, that's how, why it becomes with, its, I guess, with, with the sand. Maybe it gets some kind of electric, uh, electric charge from it, and it comes out and then it zaps whatever's around. Maybe it does. I don't know. It's not impossible, but I don't know. I don't know what this thing is. It's really ugly looking. It looks like a giant intestine jumping at you with horn, like little horns on it. And it shoots acid. Yellow, this yellow nasty acid, it would eat right through your bone. So, I don't know. I, I mean, it eats goats. It eats humans. It only comes out twice, two, two months of the year. And when he was saying there, like Destination X, Monster Hunter, all these shows always never find anything. So, what, you can't really say anything about these shows because they never find anything or they see something and they never can tell what it is i remember the lost tapes that was one they made it's just it, it's made up stuff and they talked about it and this was a giant you know worm it killed people and it, all these shows never show anything 
So, I mean, I really, other than the giant squid that they said wasn't existed either, and it does, and now they even have pictures of the, the Megalodon shark that's 62 feet underwater. They have that now. Just because they didn't find it doesn't mean it doesn't exist because they never find anything. What show have you seen anybody find anything? Bigfoot? None of them. Ghosts? Sometimes ghosts do. They find ghosts or they... But that's still shady because there's a lot of rumors that this stuff's fixed. Honestly, what you see on TV doesn't mean it exists or doesn't because they can't prove it one way or another. Just because they went out and did all these things on TV and, and all it didn't happen, they, they, and then a the week later they did the monster quest, they couldn't find uh, Bigfoot. So they, they, every creature, they never find it anyway. So I don't really go by these TV shows. I love them. Don't get me wrong. They're great shows. These tribal people believe it's existed. And these stories have come from over a thousand years, not just since 1929. That's when it got famous, started getting big. Actually, this, this, it's been going around for a thousand years or longer. Here we go with a, a mythological creature that's probably been exaggerated, but there's something there. And it's a possibility. I believe it's very probable this thing w does exist, and it lives off the land there. Like, I know mostly these camels, goats, and whatever runs around the Gobi Desert. And whatever this thing is, it's got this potent acid that kills whatever it squirts at. And it goes right through your skin or kills camels. It makes sense because it would eat down the skin so they can actually eat the creature. It, it absorbs it and it turns into like a fluid, kind of like what, uh, what spiders do. So that's weird because maybe it's some kind of weird insect breed or hybrid or something. And that's another theory I have. But it probably sucks the fluid out after it eats everything down and eats all the body down and all the fluids and cuts all the muscle out and just eats right through it and turns into like a, so it can suck it up. Because maybe it absorbs it through the body. Like it breathes through the body. I think it might breathe through the body, but it has an opening. So that's, like I said, it's, it's a real weird creature. Because there's a lot of weird creatures in the ocean that looks like this thing that have a mouth with like uh, tentacles in it and, and, it, and, and it looks like corns. It doesn't have eyes or anything. So it's a possibility this is some kind of weird hybrid creature, and it's adapted to, and it's just a nasty-looking creature. And it's adapted because, look, red skin in the hot desert, no no water. Think about it. It's got to live some way. So when it rains barely there, it comes out during those times because it rains. It makes sense. That's, that's the only thing about that. It comes out only those times. It's the raining season. So it needs water. So... That sounds like there's something with the water, but then if it's electricity based, that would that's kind of weird too. But I guess eels can be in water too, so that doesn't mean anything. So that's all I'm going to say. What do you think about that, James? A couple very interesting things here. First of all, when you talked about the yellow corrosive acid that it that it shoots out, it got me thinking about insects because you were talking about insects as well, and. Like you have the fly, okay, the common house fly. It will regurgitate on its food and then suck it up. The regurgitation will start to dissolve whatever it is on and it will suck it back up. A spider, it'll wrap you in silk and then it will inject you with a sort of venom that breaks down the body into a liquid form and then it sucks that up through a tube. Maybe that's what that is. Maybe when it shoots its venom on you and it started dissolves your body, it is so that it will liquefy it so that it can drink it, so to speak. Maybe that's how it eats. Because it doesn't really have any kind of real mandibles to, to chew with, you know, to open and close and chew. So maybe that's how it feeds is by shooting that acid on you and then liquefying your body. And then it kind of drinks up the little protein shake that you have become. That seems to make a lot of sense. So maybe that's what that is. You know, maybe we've kind of figured that portion of it out. Another thing you said that I thought was absolutely brilliant that I had never considered before was when you talked about static electricity in the sand, that maybe that's what the, the shocking is, how it, how it supposedly can shoot lightning at you. Because I was thinking and, and I was saying when I was talking earlier about that electric eel, you have to either touch it or be right next to it to get shocked. I mean, very close. And I didn't know anything other than, than lightning that really shot electricity. But static electricity will, will shoot electricity as well. Because you can literally see a tiny little lightning bolt come off your finger onto something. 
when, when you have a static charge built up. And that got me thinking when you said that, that this is in a desert. Okay, so you have sand. This thing is moving through the sand. And it pops up into the air to attack. And that got me thinking about sandstorms. And I know that sounds crazy, but stay with me and follow what I'm saying here. Because it, it, it's very profound, I think. Now, sandstorms... I, I imagine everybody knows what a sandstorm is. It's when you have a bunch of sand that gets blown up, a hurricane of sand, so to speak. Uh, we had it here in America in the Dust Bowl, where the sand would just go everywhere because a lot of the topsoil got blown off. But in a sandstorm, there's a thing called saltation. Okay, and what, what that is, is as the dry sand moves through the air, it begins a process where the sand is, is rubbing against each other in the air, and that produces a static charge. That is known as saltation. The sand particles will become polarized, and as the particles begin to hit each other, the polarization of each of the grains of sand gets rearranged, and then the degree of polarization doubles with each of the interactions. So that what happens is that builds up a a static electric charge and it's actually capable of producing little lightning bolts so sometimes during a a sandstorm you will actually see lightning but it's not lightning because there's storm clouds or anything like that it's lightning caused by static electricity in the sandstorm now that's a lot of science mumbo jumbo but what it basically means is as this creature moves through the sand it is disturbing the sand particles and causing them to rub together through that process, maybe it is building up a static electric charge. When it surfaces to attack, that static electri electric charge is released, and it finds a ground. In this case, it would be you. You would be the ground. So as it comes up, the static electric charge is released. It hits you in the form of what we would see as a lightning bolt, and maybe that's all that is. It's just a simple static electric charge that's released. Maybe it's not a weapon that the Mongolian death worm is using to attack you. Maybe it's simply just a byproduct of locomotion through the sand. I think that makes a ton of sense and it takes one of the more fantastic elements of this story that made me say, ah, I don't know, man, this is kind of cheesy, you know? It takes that cheesy element and it makes it extremely plausible. And it makes it so that I believe even stronger now that this could actually be a real creature. The third thing I was thinking as you were talking is maybe the origin of this creature is something from like the early Jurassic period or something like that, back when dinosaurs roamed the Earth. Now we know we have creatures on Earth today that were around in that time period. We have a lot of sea creatures that were around then, the sharks. Uh, some whales, we have alligators, things like that, turtles. A lot of these things were around when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. Maybe the Mongolian death worm was around as well. Maybe it is a creature that looks like it belongs in the Jurassic period because it came from the Jurassic period. Maybe it is something that has survived because in its environment, there are zero predators. I mean, this thing lives in a desert. In a desert, first of all, there's not a lot of animals, period. So it's not like you have giant predators that are going to take this thing out. Even if you had giant predators roaming the earth still, even if the dinosaurs were still chilling in the desert, they would still have to try to locate this thing and dig down in the earth to get to it. Maybe the fact that it lives under the ground and burrows everywhere has protected this creature from not only extinction through overpredation, but also extinction because of environmental events. Maybe simply it survived because it was insulated by the ground and nothing could get to it to kill it. So that that kind of explains in my mind where this thing could, could have come from and why it is so different from all the creatures that we have today. Because Old Boy was talking about the lizard that would shoot acidic venom at you from the movie Jurassic Park, that little dinosaur. And there were things like that back then. You know, the dinosaurs were a much different form of animal than what is on Earth now. The majority of the creatures on Earth now, at least. Because paleontologists at first thought they were reptiles. Then they went through a thing where they thought they were amphibians. And now we've learned that they actually had feathers, a lot of them. 
the majority of them actually had feathers. So the, they might have actually been early predecessors of birds, which is kind of crazy to think about. But they actually found remains of dinosaurs trapped in amber that looked like they looked back then. You know, they still, it was still their bodies. It wasn't just bones. They still had flesh and they still had feathers, which was very, very cool. So basically what that tells me is like most things in science, it's not really settled. We don't really truly know what the dinosaurs were and what they looked like and what their behaviors were. Because you have to realize a lot of times what scientists base these things on is simply a fragment of a bone. You go to museums and you see these giant monolithic skeletons of these amazing predatory dinosaurs like the T-Rex and stuff like that, Allosaurus. But when you actually realize that what you're looking at is not dinosaur bones, in most cases, what you're looking at is a plastic representation of dinosaur bones. And when you really dig into it, you find that out of that entire skeleton, the only bone that they actually possess could be a femur or maybe one of the little phalanges or something like that. And then you think, wow, man, they, they took one tiny little bone that's as big as my arm and they, they based an entire skeleton on it. How do they even know that that's what that skeleton looked like if they don't possess any of the other bones? Because there are dinosaurs that paleontologists have complete models of where only one tiny bone has been found from that dinosaur. And I don't mean that particular dinosaur, I mean that species of dinosaur. So in all reality, they have no idea what that thing actually looked like. They're just guessing. It's just an educated guess based on the bone or the couple bones that they do have. So we don't actually really know. So it's very plausible and, and not out of the realm of possibility at all to think that this creature could be some prehistoric throwback that survived all this time. And I don't mean the single creature survived all this time. I mean that species of creature. Because there's got to be a bunch of them in order to continue to procreate and continue to make more little creatures. I mean, in the lore, we hear about them laying their eggs inside of camels. And that's how the young will feed and grow a little bit bigger, go under the ground and continue on the process. So maybe that's exactly what this thing is. Maybe the Mongolian death worm is simply something from the age of dinosaurs that has survived to this day. It looks prehistoric, it looks crazy, because it is prehistoric. If we look at the other survivors of the, that time, they all look prehistoric too. And I think that's all we're dealing with here, honestly. I think that we're dealing with a creature from the prehistoric age, the age of dinosaurs. Now, whether it was the Jurassic or one of the other eras, I don't know, because we've never really figured out what this thing is. You know, but I think we might be on the track to that tonight. I think we might have figured out the electricity part of it, being static electricity. I think we might have figured out the, the yellow acidic vomit stuff they shoot on you that will eat your, your body. I think we figured that out as well. I think that's how they feed. Because see, when, when they talk about this thing, you don't ever really hear stories of it having these giant teeth, do you? So if it is eating people, how the hell is it eating them if it doesn't have teeth to chew us up? Because one thing about humans, we're kind of crunchy. You know, we got a whole bunch of bones. We got over 200 bones in our body, and they, they make a little crunchiness. So you can't just gum a human being. You have to have teeth to eat this thing. So how do they do it if, if they don't have teeth? Now, I'm not saying they don't have teeth, but you don't hear about it in the lore. You don't hear about giant fangs. You don't hear about big, sharp, dagger-like teeth that will crunch you up. And believe me, if this thing was giant with a mouthful of razor sharp teeth you'd know because it would be all through the lore because that's a pretty cool thing to have so that leads me to believe that maybe this thing doesn't have teeth and if it doesn't have teeth how does it eat us how does it eat camels how does it eat goats how is that happening i think that the idea that it liquefies them with its venom and then drinks it up much like a spider or a fly does makes a lot of sense to me and that takes another thing with this corrosive acid that you think, ah, oh, that's kind of outlandish as well. But it takes that and it makes it explainable and it makes it scientifically possible. It makes sense. So I think we've taken a lot of the mystery out of the Mongolian deathworm tonight with possible explanations. Now, I'm not going to say that 
that's exactly what it is. And I'm 100% correct because I have no idea. This I'm doing what other scientists do. I'm guessing tonight. That's all these are, are educated guesses. But it fits. It makes sense to me. And I don't think that it can be proven wrong because it makes sense. It fits. Now, also, I don't think it can really be proven right until we actually have one of these things that we can study. And I don't think the odds of that are very good because we can't find them. You know, we don't, like I said, we don't have any pictures of it, any real evidence. Old boy mentioned that there's a skeleton of it. I haven't seen that. I, I doubt very seriously that it's reputable because if it was, that information would be everywhere. I mean, it would be all over the place and, and everybody would, would have seen it. I've never even heard of a skeleton of it. So I'm not saying it's not true because it, it might be. I've just never heard of it myself. Where did you, uh, where did you see that old boy, the skeleton thing? It was one of the actually it was one of the pictures I seen. I was looking it up for the dead. It actually has a skeleton supposedly of this thing. And let's be fair, even if you had it real thing, people would still argue it, saying it's not real. If it came to your house and you wear it as a belt, it wouldn't make a difference if you found it. Those people have the chupacabra pictures of that, and and it, that doesn't that doesn't mean anything because. One, for one thing though, about this thing, it only comes out in June, July. So you only have two months to catch this thing. That's a very low chance of catching something. It isn't like Bigfoot, it comes out all the time. This only comes out two times. And, and I mean, two months of the year. So that, your odds of catching this thing anyway is very slim. But I saw a picture of it. It had like a skeleton. I'll send it to you after this. I don't know if it's replicable, but there's a guy that said he, this was supposedly a... Like I said, people still think it would be fake. There's people have pictures of Bigfoot, but I'll send it to you after the show. Now, like you were saying, there's there is this thing could be prehistoric, and that's what I think. And I that's what I that's what I'm coming close to. And the reason we don't see it is it only comes rarely out two times a month, a year. Sorry, guys, two two months of the year, and that's why it's hard to find this thing. And it only supposedly comes out at night, so that even gives you even harder chance to catch this thing. So it would make sense because there's not much in the desert to eat anyway, but few camels, goats, and humans. And it probably, like you said, it sucks. You, you they they shoot that acid and it it just kills you all, and it just it eats right through you and it turns like 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 a liquid and they would just you drink it up because it's impossible for it to eat shoot with no teeth to to chew. Unless it swallows you like a python. Now remember, pythons have teeth, but they don't bite people. They've been known to swallow people in big animals. So now that's a possibility, too, that it kills you with this acid, burns off a lot of skin, and, you know, it, it starts eating everything and dec decaying everything, and it, it, it just gobbles you up. But it would be, have to be very big, bigger than 7 feet long. It'd have to be, like, 15, 20 feet long, like a python. So... That, that I think it, if it does kill somebody, it probably had that acid turns it into a liquidified you know, substance what you turn into, and it sucks it up. You yeah, see, that's interesting as well because I was I was thinking about that when I was talking about it possibly being a new version of sand boa because the I, I talked about the spitting cobra how it shoots its venom, but the problem is a python is not a venomous snake; it's a constrictor, so it would have to be some weird hybrid version of a snake that we've never discovered before that has venom but is also a form of a constrictor even though it doesn't constrict it's strange to, to try to explain but it could be that that it simply softens it up so it can swallow it easier with with that venom as well you know maybe the point of it is not to liquefy it completely maybe the point is of it is just to tenderize it so to speak so that it can more easily be swallowed that, that could be a possibility as well. Because like you were saying, a python has teeth, but they're not like teeth that are meant for ripping flesh and, and chewing flesh. It doesn't really have molars and canines. It has almost like hooks, basically. A lot of your snakes, your constrictors will have like hooks that their teeth face back towards their stomach. So what it does is it hooks into the, the, the flesh of the prey and it keeps you from getting back out of the mouth. So as they they move you down their throat into their into their body, little by little with muscle movement, it's pulling you forward. So it's almost like little hooks that grab, pull, 
and then grab again and then pull to kind of move you backwards. But they're facing towards the animal's stomach so that the prey can't wiggle its way back out of the mouth because it's impaled on these hooks that are facing the direction that it wants you to go, not the direction that you want to go. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it makes sense to me. Um, we're almost out of time. Um, I'm going to go to Old Boy here in a second for shout outs. But before we do that, uh, we'll do a final sum up of, of this creature and, and if we think it exists again. Because I think that everything that was on the table as far as being a little fantastic and making this harder to believe, I think we've explained in this episode pretty well. So to me, there's absolutely nothing left that would be any reason why this thing could not exist. So I'm going to go from possible to probable. I mean, I believe that when you look at all the different eyewitness accounts, and then what I always do, if I look at eyewitness accounts, there's a ton of them, then I ask myself, okay, there's a whole bunch of people that have claimed to see this thing. What are the reasons why it cannot exist? And if there's a whole bunch of reasons that make it impossible, then that's how I make my decision on whether I believe that this thing actually exists or not. And I also look at the fact, is there evidence? Is there pictures, bodies, that kind of thing? But everything that, that says that this thing doesn't exist, that it can't, has been explained. So I don't see any reason why the Mongolian death worm could not be a real creature that exists in the desert. I mean, everything that would make me think, ah, I don't know, that's a little exaggerated, has been explained, and explained in a way that makes a lot of sense and is scientifically possible. So my ruling on this is going to be probable. I think that it's very probable that the Mongolian death worm is an actual creature, a prehistoric creature from way back when, when, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, and it's still around today, and that's what I believe it is. What do you think, old boy? And then go ahead and do your shout-outs. I think it's probable. I think it exists. It may, it's been exaggerated, but I think it exists. It might. It's probably uh, a prehistoric, or it could be a new breed of creature or a mutated creature. And that's another possibility that we didn't talk about. But, you know, we'll, we, we'll do another show about this down the line. And, yeah, I want to give a shout-out to um, everybody who listens to the show, all the followers on you, uh, YouTube, um, remember, if you want to listen to all our other shows, just subscribe to James Hersey Jr., the big bald dude. Um, <laughs> you want to uh, either have ads or you want to sponsor us, remember, hit us up on Facebook, James Ash, old boy, or uh, James Hersey Jr., and we're looking for sponsors. Or if you want to do advertising, we have a pretty good deal going. Um, I want to thank all our listeners from Parax. I love you guys. I want to tell you that you guys are amazing and we love doing these stories and just remember something guys when people say things don't exist dinosaurs exist that's proven fact they got the bone for it i know people try to argue this but majority of the people the world believed in dinosaurs they existed at one time so why wouldn't anything else exist if these crazy creatures lived years millions of years ago why would nothing like like Bigfoot and some other creatures not exist. That's crazy to me because dinosaurs exist. They did. As much crazy as people don't want to realize that one time these giant monsters, dinosaurs, giant birds slash, uh, you know, lizards, snakes, uh, whatever they were, sea monsters existed at one time. Sea monsters did exist. They were giant dinosaurs in the ocean that swam. Sharks giant so they existed they have the bones they have everything to prove that so why wouldn't anything else exist like all the like the mongolian death worm and i want to say happy birthday to my daughter her birthday was just last week she's 17 next year 18 uh shout out to my girlfriend shout out shout out to tammy g i one of my close friends paranormal uh she we, we had her uh uh, investigator last week she was doing uh, a show with it we did with uh um the ouija board and it was great you guys need to check that one out but i love you everybody have a great night misfits sugar ladies and monster hunters i love you good night blessed be yeah, i'd like to talk about an event that's going to be coming up uh the event is going to be called ghost miners of columbia the reason why i'm talking about this tonight is 
it's a charity event. And those people that know me well know that I give a tremendous amount of money to charity. I do a whole lot to try to help different charities and different people out. And so I'm going to be talking about this event a little bit tonight. Uh, Lost Souls Investigations is putting on the event. And all the profits are being donated to the Lung Cancer Research Foundation. And it's going to be a pretty cool event. Uh, they're going to have a bunch of different uh, guest speakers. They're going to have, you know, from the paranormal world, they're going to have a raffle where you can win some cool stuff. Uh, there's going to be like some fun paranormal games with prizes and stuff like that. So you can do the full weekend for $150. Or for if you want to do just the investigation portion, that's a hundred dollars, and you can get your tickets at uh, lostsoulsinv.org. Is where you can go to do it. We'll be putting up the link to it on our Staring into the Abyss Facebook page. So go on over to Facebook and look up Staring into the Abyss and find that page and join that, and that's where you can find the link to it. It should be a pretty cool event. Um, it's going to be happening sometime in September. I'm not sure of the exact date, but I'll get that information for you guys. So you have a little bit of time before it comes. But uh, I'm going to be talking about this as time goes on and I'll give you some of the speakers that are going to be there and the exact date and all that kind of stuff. But it's sometime in September, but it's going to be a really cool event. And like I said, the profits for it are going to be going to the Lung Cancer Research Foundation. So it's for a really good cause. And that's something that's close to my heart. So... If you guys are into the paranormal and you want to go and listen to some really cool speakers that are going to be talking about paranormal issues and participate in some cool stuff, check out the Ghost Miners of Columbia. I'd also like to give you the links real quick. The YouTube channel is youtube.com slash James Hershey Jr. That's where you can find all the Staring to the Abyss episodes. You can also find a bunch of other side videos that we've done on different paranormal topics and different things. Uh, it's a pretty cool it's a pretty cool channel. There's a whole bunch of neat stuff for you guys to check out. It's 100% free. It's there for you to enjoy it, so please do. Our merchandise store is teespring.com slash stores slash staring into the abyss. Uh, on that site, you can find all the different merch for staring. You can find the you know, t-shirts, sweatshirts, tank tops, cell phone cases, whatever. There's, there's tons of different merch there. So if you're in the market for Staring into the Abyss merch, then check that out. Once again, it's teespring.com. That's T-E-E-S-P-R-I-N-G.com slash store slash Staring into the Abyss. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you for all the support and all the love that you give us. We greatly appreciate that. And until we speak to you again, love many, trust few, and do harm to none. God loves you, and so do we. Bye-bye.